Welcome everyone to Special Education Legal Fund's last webinar of 2021, Getting Past the Sticker Shock, Approved versus Non-Approved Special Education Schools. My name is Christine Lai and I am the Executive Director and Co-Founder of Special Education Legal Fund. I am so pleased to welcome our distinguished panelists and our guests tonight for tonight's discussion. First off, I wanted to um, extend a special thanks to our sponsors for the webinar series um, and this parent education program, Winston Preparatory School, American School for the Deaf, Chapel Haven Schliefer Center, Fusion Academy, the Pinnacle School, Spire mm -hmm. School, Villa Maria School, and the Hubbard Day School. Thank you to all of our, of our sponsors and partners. Before we get into this, um, I wanted to share a few words about Special Education Legal Fund for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Special Education Legal Fund, or SELF, was founded in 2018 to provide grants for families in need with children in the special education system. Since our founding, we have provided over $430,000 in grants for legal support from qualified special education attorneys to over 100 families in 40 school districts across Connecticut and Westchester County. We are currently very pleased this year to offer two grants programs, the Legal Assistance Program, which provides up to $5,000 in support from a qualified special education attorney, and the Advocacy Support Program, which provides up to $1,000 in support from a qualified special education advocate. We accept um, applicants from Connecticut and Westchester for our attorney program, and for Connecticut only for the Advocacy Program. We accept applicants with an IEP for the attorney program and an IEP or 504 for the advocate program. Um, you, there's more information about our programs online and the application process can be, uh, can be initiated online. The website is at the bottom of this screen. Everyone can look there. And there's also a little video about how to fill out an application and start the process. Our next webinar, um, just a little plug for our January webinar series, will be um, in, on January 12th, and it is called A Life Plan for Special Education Advocacy. And we will feature the advocates Jill Chuckas, Ann Munkenbeck, Virginia Blum, and Lara Damashek. And we're really, really pleased. The advocacy um, you know, panels are always really, really popular and really, really helpful to our families and families in the community. So be sure to register through the same um, Eventbrite channel that you use to register for this panel. And now the introductions. Um, this is Christy Chandler's third, I think, appearance, right? Third um, appearance in our webinar series. Um, or maybe even fourth, I don't know. And we are super excited to welcome her back. Um, she has done um, you know, a transition program, um, a, a bunch of different talks for us, and we are super excited to, um, to talk to her tonight, particularly because her perspective on transition programs and the approved schools is invaluable. And we're really happy to have her. So thank you, Christy. Our next panelist is Bill DeHaven. And he's our second member of the panel. He is new-ish to the um, Connecticut special education community, having joined um, Villa Maria School in Stamford in, um, gosh, when was that? 2020? 2019? You don't even remember. It's, it's all a blur. Um, he is an old hand, if I'm allowed to say that, in, um, in the world of special education from his previous life as the head of Winston Preparatory School in New York, where he was the head of school for... I don't know, 22 years, something like that. So um, we welcome you know, Bill's extensive experience, particularly in his perspective as now being the head of school of an approved Connecticut school coming from his position as being the head of school of a non-approved New York school. So welcome, Bill. Thank you, Christine. Our next panelist is Paula Morbido. Um, Paula, this is her first time on one of our panels. We're super excited to welcome her. Um, but she and American School for the Deaf have been longtime friends and partners of ours. So we're really excited to have her. Um, Paula brings a really unique perspective um, to this panel, to this particular subject, 
from her current role as the Assistant Education Director of the American School for the Deaf, but also in her prior life as the Director of Student Services in public schools in a number of different regions. So she's got great perspective on, you know, the way that school districts look at, you know, these, you know, two different types of schools and, and how that has changed over the years. So welcome, Paula. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And next is Tammy Moscript. Dr. Moscript is also um, new to our webinar series, um, and we're delighted to have her. Um, Tammy is the direct, uh, executive director of the Spire School in Stanford. And I particularly look forward to her um, thoughts on this topic because um, Spire School did not start out as a, an approved school. They chose to, you know, to to go that route after um, having been established for a couple of years. And so I'm really, really interested in hearing um, what she has to say on that topic. And also from her perspective um, as the head of Spire School and the services that Spire provides, you know, that are more therapeutic in nature and how that relates to, you know, sort of the approval process in Connecticut. So welcome, Tammy. Thank you so much, Christine. And finally, we have um, our last but not least, um, is Jamie Williamson. I'd like to welcome him to the panel. Jamie is new to this panel series and a relative newcomer to the Fairchester independent special education scene, but he also has extensive experience working with students who learn differently um, back in his native um, land of Ohio. Um, I love that he's a fellow Midwesterner because that tells me all I need to know about him. Um, mm -hmm. So welcome, Jamie. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And lastly, this wouldn't be a, a webinar in the COVID era without a disclaimer. Um, this webinar panel is presented for informational purposes only. It is intended as a resource for families who are navigating the special education system in Connecticut or New York and is not intended to provide legal support, advice, or assistance to any particular individual, um, or nor is it intended to replace the advice and counsel of a qualified special education attorney. This webinar should not be construed as an endorsement by special education legal fund or any of its representatives of any of the participants in this panel. For webinar participants, this panel should be viewed as a public forum. Please do not ask questions via the Zoom platform, either in the Q&A or the chat, that in contain identifiable information about your child or your child's educational or legal system, situation, sorry. Um, you can email questions to me. I will put my email in the chat and please refrain from any comments that include information about your child, including name, grade, school, school district. Um, please remember that your screen name may be visible to the participants in this panel, as well as the panelists and special education legal fund. This webinar is being recorded and may be distributed or shown at a later date at the discretion of Special Education Legal Fund. So here we are, getting past the sticker shock, approved versus non-approved special education schools. Um, I was saying before, you know, to the panelists before we began that most of these um, webinar topics come, you know, because I, um, you know, want to ask a question. You know, and the question here for me was, you know, what's the difference between an approved school and a non-approved school? Um, I know, like, you know, essentially my knowledge of the differences between the two schools, two types of schools really um, is focused around the outplacement process and how um, students are placed into approved schools and non-approved schools in Connecticut. But I think that what I'd like to do, um, if we could start out, is if we could talk a little bit about, you know, independent schools and the accreditation process. Um, and, um, you know, Jamie, you know, maybe you want to start off and, you know, and just tell us a little bit about, you know, how a, an independent school goes through the accreditation process. What do they have to do? And, and who's accrediting them? Who is, who's coming in, you know, every year or two years or three years and, you know, checking boxes and, you know, and, and making sure, you know, all everyone's I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to happy to happy to go there. So uh, so for those of you, so uh, I'm the head of school at Windward. Um, so we are a co-educational uh, day program, uh, grades first through nine. We have a small ninth grade, which is a transitional year for our kids, and we specialize in language-based learning disabilities, uh, primarily dyslexia. But uh, from a from an accreditation standpoint, we actually are accredited uh, both by New York State 
uh, just as a, a charter program in that regard, um, as a non-public charter. But we also have our accreditation through what's called NYSACE, which is the New York State Association for Independent Schools. And the, the process from, from, from NYSACE's perspective is really about sort of mission congruence. So we have a mission to serve kids with language-based learning disabilities. We have a whole teaching sort of methodology built around that, a training program, engagement for parents in the process. And so when they do their evaluation, we write a big, like a, a pretty lengthy, you know, 100 plus page self-report about what we do, why we do it, how we operate, how we function, uh, which is a really great, we're actually going to the that process right now with, with nice ace we've got our visit coming up in uh, in april of this year so we're in the process of writing that report right now and it's, it's pretty it's a pretty thorough reflection um but i think from a nice ace standpoint it's really about are you doing what you say you're doing it's about mission congruence about this sort of you know aligning the the action to the what what the what the hope is for the community and and that that process occurs here in new york's uh, piece there's a 10-year cycle but there's like little steps in between where we have to do some additional follow-up work um, to do this, I think the initial cred accreditations are pretty rigorous, um, and the follow-up accreditations are are manageable, but actually still pretty pretty involved. So, um, so we write up a big report. Um, NYSE sends a visiting team out. They calm the building for three days. Um, and when I say calm the building, they're out uh, meeting and talking to teachers. They talk to parents. They talk to students. They talk to our trustees. They look at every single facet of our school life, from academic program to extracurricular to how we monitor progress, to how we talk about our fundraising work and how we do some uh, some other programmatic components. So, and then they, 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 at the end of that, they give us a set of uh, commendations, some things that we, that we that they feel we're doing well, and some things that we can work on in terms of recommendations um, that align with both the, you know, our strategic plan in terms of things that we're still trying to kind of push forward, but also in terms of nice, um, you know, kind of principles of good practice. So we get evaluated against that standard as well. And so how, I mean, this sounds like a really, um, you know, involved process. Um, how often does it take place? How often do you go through that process? So the, the big one is every 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you do a mini one every, like, I think every four to five years. Mm -hmm. So we have to submit little reports and progress reports along the way. And so, um, so yeah, during COVID, I think some of our, uh, some, of the, some of the staging and sort of uh, timelines have gotten a little bit off. We, we got a year right. off. Uh, from because we were supposed right, to do this process right, last year yeah. in the middle of everything. So yeah, uh, hence we're doing it this year. So, so this one's a big um, one for you. The one you're doing right now. It's mm -hmm. the big one. It's yeah. the once every but as a, as a as a third year head of school uh, in this particular organization, you know, um, I think it's actually a really good self self sort of exploration process. Um, it gives me a really good sense of where our community is on some things and gives us some good feedback for how we move forward uh, and engage the community and our students and our, our faculty and our trustees along the way. So it sounds like a gut check for it. everybody. You know, it sounds like a mm -hmm. gut check for like the whole community yeah. and for the teachers, the faculty, the students, the board, yeah. you know, and just making sure everybody's doing, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. So I think that's yeah. really interesting. I don't think most people know that schools do that, honestly, yeah. you know, even those mm -hmm. of us who have schools, like have students in, you know, in, in private schools or in independent schools, whether they be typical or, you know, or, um, yeah. you know, or, or, or not, um, uh, they, I don't think we, you know, really have a sense of what that, what that means. Um, you know, so, you know, moving on from that, um, you know, can we, um, can, I would love for us to talk about the difference between that accreditation process and the special education approval process. You know, um, you know, a few other uh, panelists are, you know, familiar with the special education school um, process. You know, maybe Bill, you know, having you're you're kind of I know in the middle of, um, you know, of you know meeting all those requirements. You know, maybe you can you know talk a little bit about. Um, you know, how you found that moving from a New York non-approved school to a Connecticut, you know, approved special education school. I'm going to try not to focus on my, my frustrations. <laughs> um, I'm going to echo everything that Jamie said. I think that the self-evaluation process that Nice Ace asks their school to go through, and it's the same thing with the CAIS, which we are also accredited by the Connecticut Association of Independent Schools. It is a wonderful every 10 year, uh, are you, is your mission true? Are you living your mission? Someone comes in and, and, and asks you to think about that. The contrast to that. Now, part of the reason why I moved um, from an independent school to a state approved school is so that, well, to get past the sticker shock, my true hope was, could I do the work that I know that we're able to do in a state approved model? And 
my frustration uh, quickly becomes. And now, honestly, I have not yet gone through the state accreditation process mm -hmm. uh, that, that will happen in 2023. Um, I, I do, I actually brought it um, home with me because every year I have to sign, we all have to sign an annual statement of assurances uh -huh. to guarantee to the state that we, well, unlike what Jamie talked about, unlike it's not asking me, am I doing what I'm saying I'm doing? Um, there are three things to check off whether I have, um, do my teachers have proper certification and you know, the, my frustrated one, the one that causes me the greatest frustration, there are three about physical re restraint and seclusion. Yes. Now, now my, my biggest frustration with that is that no one is asking me about how my, what my approach to teaching reading or writing or any of social emotional skills, how to learn skills, mm -hmm. what I think about executive functioning. Yeah. They're asking me, did I go through seclusion and restraint training? When that, unfortunately, when we talk to the world about special education, often that's, well, Bill's at a special ed school. Well, is, is he a behavior problem? Because he doesn't seem that way. And yeah. unfortunately, most of our kids live in that gray area. Yeah. And the fact that the, the state of Connecticut is just re, overly focused on, that, yeah, makes me a little bit frustrated. So I don't, I, I'll stop being um, frustrated with that, but, yeah. but. Really the difference is, the true difference for me already is about compliance and compliance with, with checking off boxes rather than thinking about our, our program and, mm -hmm. and what we're doing to help our kids who are struggling. Yeah. Well, it brings like, I mean, there are certain opportunities that come with being approved, you know, which, you know, obviously is the, you know, is the ability to serve, you know, I mean, perhaps a broader range of student, you know, um, a student, you know, broader, you know, economic, um, you know, uh, student with broader economic backgrounds, and that's important. Um, but obviously, it comes with, you know, um, significant um, regulatory frameworks you know, which, you know, clearly, you know, at certain points, you know, can, um, you know, can hamper your ability to like, you know, move, you know, in one way or the other, you know, Tammy, I know that um, you, you know, that, um, that you all at Spire and Pinnacle, you know, started out on one side of the fence, you know, um, as it were, and decided to move from the one side to the other side. Um, what was the thought process around that? And, you know, how have you um, been able to, you know, kind of navigate some of those things that, you know, that Bill has alluded to um, while being able to be true to your mission as Jamie had, um, had spoken about in the first question? Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to mention that Spire is a therapeutic day school located in Stanford. We serve students in grades six through 12. Um, and our students typically have depression, anxiety, a lot of school avoidance. And so I can relate to what Jamie and Bill have both talked about because we are both NIAS accredited as well as state approved as a special education school. So I can appreciate, yes, being held to your mission and going through a rigorous self-reflection process to be able to assess you know, 15 different standards and all the indicators to really make sure we're true to our mission. But I can also understand the flip side of checking the box for compliance purposes. Um, for Spire in particular, the first five years, we were privately placed, funded, you know, only through parents um, to start. And I think I share Bill's concerns about reaching a broader audience and realizing we had this wonderful program that could suit a, a broader population, but it just wasn't possible given the sticker shock. Um, and it was a tough decision because one well, there's a couple, but one of the major factors to consider is that we were operating under this independent school umbrella where you didn't need to have specific teacher certification, right? You can bring in just intellectuals and, and passionate teachers who connected mm -hmm. well with students who yeah. were experts in their domains and love sharing their passions and knowledge. And then suddenly we had to tick the boxes if we decided to go for state approval. And that was going to be a big decision because was our current team willing to go through the certification process? And if not, we were losing some truly great teachers and then yeah. had to obviously go through a recruitment process to bring in those teachers who did meet the Connecticut certification needs. Um, in the long run, clearly, we did decide to go through the state approval 
process and it was highly valuable. Um, yes, it did mean a dramatic shift in our staffing. We had to make a lot of different decisions there, but it also was very instrumental in terms of us thinking about the students that we could reach and the programming that was necessary to reach that type of student and certainly receiving the district support to be able to fund tuition and provide transportation for our students was right. huge. Right. How does it, I mean, you mentioned an interesting, um, you know, uh, point about teachers. Um, you know, that I remember when, um, you know, my son was at Winston Prep in Connecticut for a number of years, which is, which is not an approved special education school, um, but was a wonderful experience for, for our family. Um, he had one particular teacher who um, was teaching what taught math, but in his previous, um, you know, his previous role had, at, had been a, a school psychologist at a public school. And, you know, so that I thought was, you know, really like, um, and he had been a school psychologist for like, you know, 30 years and was really just tremendous at, at getting to, you know, how to teach, you know, what, what is a difficult, you know, and to me annoying subject, which was geometry, I think it was, was geometry and, and really getting to, you know, um, all the different ways that the kids learned. So um, that's a real interesting point about like, you know, about having to, um, you know, look at teachers and the whole of the program in a different, you know, in sort of a different mindset. Um, you know, Paula, um, I was wondering if you, you know, being our sort of, um, you know, I, I don't want to say lone public school, um, you know, kind of pseudo representative, but um, I would love to hear how, you um, you know, York's in your experience, I mean, you've been at, you know, ASD for, you know, a few years now. Um, and what is your, you know, what's your experience, you know, on, you know, as a, um, as a director of, you know, student services and how, how do like districts look at, you know, the different programs, you know, is it, is it specifically through, you know, cause I know what I think, you know, but, um, you know, but how do they really look at the, at the different programs and what they're doing, what they've like, what they can um, provide for the students. Sure. So, um, you know, at American School for the Deaf, we work with children. We serve children from preschool through age 22. Um, so we have accreditation through NEAS, State Department of Ed, and uh, CEASD, which is the Council on Educators of and uh, Administrators for Schools for the Deaf. Um, and Bill, I just went through the uh, SDE reapproval process. So if you have any questions, give me a call because <laughs> this is all really new to me. Um, being on the public side for so many years, I you know did participate at a small level on the NEAS process for the public school. Um, but the other part about accreditation and approval is sometimes there's a perfect storm and all of them come due in one year because of COVID or delays. So this year we had NEASC, our five-year report. We had CEASD, uh, full reapproval, and CEASD. So this has been an entire year. So this is truly fresh in my mind right now. Um, so yeah, it's definitely been a learning experience for me too as I as start my third year um, on the private side. Um, but getting back to your question, Christine, you know, I I can only speak for myself in my experience. So in prior to being a special ed director in a public school, I was a teacher of the deaf at a school for, in New York. Um, and so that experience was a little bit different than even when I went to the public school uh, side. Um, and so when I, again, I'll only speak from my own perspective of being a special ed director. When I would go to a PPT and if we were not able to meet the needs of a student, we certainly do look at accreditation and approval just because that was generally, um, you know, our assurance that they were looking at, you know, teachers who had the qualifications that there was, you know, a continuous program, you know, a focus on program, you know, reapprovals and, you know, program improvement. So we would certainly look at, at, at those, those types of perspectives, but ultimately, I, you know, again, just speaking for myself, which program would best meet the needs of that student and mm -hmm. what exactly they were needing. Again, I can't speak for all special ed directors, but that was certainly my perspective. And mm -hmm. perhaps that's why I ended up in a, in a private app set because <laughs> that's <laughs> what I, you know, felt that was what was best for, you know, students should be at the forefront. Can you explain what an APSEP is, Christy, because, um, you know, because Paula just threw it out there and, um, you know, first for our, um, you know, our audience members who may not, um, you know, who may already be confused by all the different, um, you know, abbreviations and nomenclatures and, you know, LRE, IDEA, you know, FAPE, um, whatever. So if you could explain that, that would be super. 
Sure, sure. So actually, that was a new acronym for me, too. I had always just called this like an approved special education school, which that's what the acronym stands for. So it means that you've gone through the process with, in our case, in Connecticut's uh, and actually Massachusetts State Department of Education. Um, We've had the thick binders that with all the policies, all the procedures, all the site visits to ensure that we're in compliance with our curriculum, our teacher certifications, all the things that you guys have been addressing. Um, And I will say too that, you know, at Chapel Haven, we're kind of unique because we're out of that K-12 realm. We're a post-secondary program. And I think back to your earlier point, Christine, a lot of families don't think about accreditations for those types of programs, but there are accrediting um, places that do that. And we are accredited through CARF, which is the Commission for the Accreditation of Rehabilitation Facilities. And so one of the things that we do when we're talking with families in the admissions process is really encourage them to ask that question as they're visiting different programs, because it does, you know, provide that level of assurance that someone has, you know, taken a really close look, that they verified that you are doing the things that you're saying that you're doing, you know, and and that you have that quality there, which is nice. That is nice. Do you, um, you mentioned, um, you know, other, you know, um, being approved in states other than Connecticut, you know, as a residential Mm -hmm. program, obviously that's, you know, that's a, um, you know, that's a, that that would be key. Um, Are, you know, are you, are you all approved in more than one state? You know, I mean, I know Jamie, you know, that this doesn't apply to you, but, um, you know, I think, you know, um, ASD is also approved in Massachusetts as well. Um, so how does, how do those processes differ, um, you know, in different states? Anybody can take this. I don't, you know, it, it's, it, it's fair game for all of you. I will say in our case, you know, Connecticut was a no brainer that we were going to get yeah. that approval, but, um, In our instances, Massachusetts came about because we had a student from Massachusetts who really wanted their school district support. And so Massachusetts was willing to have that conversation with us. And, you know, we were able to meet their requirements. We've also had students in the past from New Jersey, and they're kind of uh, unique in that you don't get like a blanket approval that lasts. Like you have to have a student that's going to be placed there in order to kind of go through that approval process. And Okay. So you um, can go to New Jersey and say like, I want approval. You right. know, you would have to have the student come in first and then, you know, and then go through it. Oh, that's yep. interesting. That's kind of yeah. annoying, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't seem like, you know, that doesn't seem efficient at all, but whatever. Anyway. The, the New Jersey funding process is completely different from, from New York or Connecticut. It's interesting, though, because New, uh, New Jersey, well, this is a total aside, but New, um, New Jersey school districts have like a captive insurance co- um, com- company that handles the legal costs for their, you know, and, and so like, it, I think it has a definite impact on, you know, the rate of settlement and how like if an insurance company is involved in anything, they're always wanting to like settle beforehand. But, um, but this is a total aside. Um, so, so you all have gone, so you'll go through that process in New Jersey, if you have like a particular student that is that's coming to the community. And what about Massachusetts? Is that kind of a, is that the same, the same thing? For us, that's how it came about most recently. I don't know if that's, you know, their actual policy or not, but that was how we most recently experienced it. Um, it's, I've always thought it was interesting because, um, you know, being from Greenwich, you know, being from kind of lower Fairfield County, it's like it, you know, there's obviously a lot of, um, you know, of state crossover. Both of my, my, both my kids go to school in Westchester and uh, we cross the border every day, you know, so I've always wondered, you know, how, and Greenwich is a little bit different because we sit on the border and, you know, so that, you know, there, there are placements that happen in, um, you know, it, you know, at, at a Windward, you know, as opposed to an Eagle Hill or, you know, a a Westfield Day program, you know, on the more, you know, um, therapeutic side, you know, and I always wonder how, um, you know, so Greenwich is a little different that way because, you know, of that, you know, sort of cross-border, um, you know, um, positioning. Um, I did want to ask, um, you know, that, um, you know, it, do you feel like um, it's, you know, that um, being placed at it, for a student to be placed at an out-of-state school is more difficult than, um, than being placed at an in-state school? It doesn't really matter. I get this question a lot because, you know, know that, what we um dealing with because we're state approved in Connecticut and not yet though we're, we're thinking about going through the process in New York because yeah. I have so many New York families mm-hmm. um, going to a 
IEP meeting with a CSE in anywhere in Westchester County is so very different yeah. than going to a IEP meeting with a PPT anywhere in, in the state of Connecticut. And so um, they, they do not make it easy at all. Even for kids who really, really, need really need it. Yeah, no, I'm sure. Um, I do want to get back, um, you know, before we sort of, um, you know, go too far down this rabbit hole um, of, you know, what are the particular benefits of being a non-approved special education school? You know, like Jamie, I wonder if you could speak to the, um, you know, you know, how Windward um, is able to serve the population that they've identified, you know, that, that you've identified as being your core student and how you feel like you're best able to do that um, with the, you know, in, with, you know, with the, in the non-approved, you know, model that you have? Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question. And I'm going to echo a little bit of Paula's uh, earlier comment here about the idea of wanting to serve kids in needs and creating a space. I'm full disclosure. Sometimes I jokingly say I'm a recovering school psychologist. Um, you know, I spent years working in public school, evaluating kids and working to kind of problem solve academically, behaviorally. And I loved the work. Um, but I left public education because I really felt there were so many strings attached to the process. And, and I'm really about trying to find ways to meet kids' needs and in, in, in the work. And I felt so often that we were sort of at odds in that conversation. I worked at the public middle school where I had you know, sixth graders come in who were at third grade reading level. And then in eighth grade, lo and behold, they were still at third grade reading. And I would produce a novel idea, like maybe we teach them how to read. And that was that was met with uh, a lot of uh, a lot of ambivalence. Shock and, and awe, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and a little bit of apathy. Yeah. Um, it was really about teach, just teach, let's teach the test, give them, give them accommodations, and we'll just get them through. And I'm, and one of the things I love about sort of being a kind of a, a fully independent program is that I get to have a chance to kind of make those decisions as a community based on our needs and based on the needs of our kids and our mission. So we have a lot of choice around who we hire, how we train, how we sort of go through the process. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the beauty of it is that parents have, have, have the final say at the end of the day. So if they don't like what we, we're doing, they, they, they make a choice to go somewhere else. Um, so it's really on us to kind of provide our absolute best work for, for a child and for a family. And, and our families talk about the transformative experience they have within our walls. And, you know, I, this is my, I think, 17th, 18th year in education. I've, sometimes I lose count. Um, but, um, but, you know, and from a teacher's Your education career is, a, is, a, is not a minor. Yeah. Anymore. That's it. They're, they're a, yeah, they're a exactly. fully fledged yeah. adult. Yeah. And, and as a, uh, you know, and as we think about, um, you know, the, the, the work we do with, with educators and teachers, you know, I have yet to uh, been interviewing teachers for a while and I have yet to meet someone who's ready to work in our program, right? I, again, folks coming out of high power special education, master's reading specialists, we have to kind of actually help them unlearn some things because a lot of graduate programs will sort of put in front of, you know, their students some things that aren't really technically research-based, you know, it's, uh, it's more uh, marketing um, and things that feel good for folks, but not actually mm -hmm. having a lot of good evidence for it. So we get to focus on research-based practice in our, in our work. We get to train teachers up. We actually, that's when I was I'm hearing, listening to, to Bill and to, to Paula and Christy talk about sort of the, um, the staffing uh, conundrums of, of, of this, the state piece. You know, we actually get to transcend that a little bit. I get to hire some really incredible educators and they, and we run them through our two-year teacher training program. So that I think your training program is one of the most amazing things um, that, know, that, yeah. I, that I, I've yet yeah. seen. And I'm sure I, I used, that you wouldn't be able to do any of that or the Windward Institute or any of that stuff. Um, yeah. and, and really train teachers all over the country now, you know, because yeah. um, of Zoom and everything and, and yeah. have that, you know, that sort of like iterative effect on the world of special education if you yeah. were in a model that, um, you know, was more, you know, restrictive, quote unquote. Yeah. And, you know, and I think to, to your point, you know, we've actually during during COVID, we've tried to capitalize on all of the challenges and the opportunities that lay ahead of us in this moment. But, you know, our, our teacher training work has been actually has been international. So we had pre-COVID, we were training about 1600 teachers a year through our coursework and our, our lecture series. And now we're hitting about 7600 from across like 40 different countries. Mm -hmm. So we've really worked to expand that work because I do think that the work we do. I'm trying to kind of support uh, the work out in the community, but but being a non-funded school gives me a lot of flexibility to design the program really around student needs. And to that point, where you know when we're looking at language arts, you know sort of requirements uh, in class time, I think school you see where school programs are by how they sort of create their schedules. And so we have almost you know two and a half hours of language arts instruction for our kids a day. 
So that way we really can do a deep dive on skills. We can integrate mm -hmm. the writing work. We can have a lot of great comprehension work to make sure we're targeting kids at the level that they need to. And we can group them in the way that we need to move them so that way we can actually have small, really tight, homogeneous um, uh, you know, instructional groups to, to make sure we're maximizing our impact for kids. Um, I would like to, on that note, oh, Bill, do you want to say something? I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I was just, I mean, Jamie just described, I think, it, it just encapsulated the answer to your question of the night, getting past the sticker shock. I mean, that's it. You know, the ability to, to train your teachers and, and to, to mm -hmm. choose teachers who are the very best teachers for yeah. our kids yep. is really the cost of our yeah. school. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is you know, true. And to that, that sticker shock, I think the one thing that, you know, we've been even working on here in our, our narrative, because I, you know, when you, when folks look at our website and you see our tuition price, there is this sort of like, oh, I can't do that. But I think the other thing that I would, would argue that's part of that narrative is really the active work that we do to make sure we're recruiting families of all uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. We yeah. give out about $7.2 million in financial aid every year. Um, and so, but we don't, you know, we don't talk about that as much as yeah. we could. Um, and we work with families. We want to make sure that we, if, when we have, we're, we're, we're needs blind. Uh, yeah. So when it comes to our missions process, so when you're coming into our work, you know, there's some independent schools will say, well, we'd love to have you. Can you afford to pay? And if your answer is no, then they put you on a wait list. Mm -hmm. That's not how we, we do our work. Yeah, we yeah. serve the, the neediest kids from an academic standpoint, and then we figure out how to work with families to make it happen. Yeah. I'm always a big fan. I love, you know, the financial aid program, obviously. Um, I am a big fan, obviously, because of what we do in, um, you know, and having, you know, families, you know, make their school district accountable for the program that they're not able to provide for the student. And to that yeah. end, you know, that's really why we were established is to provide families who couldn't afford an attorney but needed one because they were stuck in yeah. the advocacy process and their child didn't have the um, appropriate supports to be able to, you know, to get there and to and to be there yeah. to be able to attend a Winward or, you know, a um, or a Villa Maria or in any other school that's not approved or approved or whatever. Um, even if a school's approved, that doesn't mean that the school district's going to place a child there. You know, that is not yeah. like, you know, that is not a done deal, obviously. So, um, you know, I, I do appreciate that. And I think that, um, you know, you know, something that I try to do all the time is talk to families about like, you know, like how to get to the process, you know, like, you know, get beyond the, the, the price you know, and, and how, and, and what it is. Cause like a lot of it, they're like, I can't afford that. But a lot of times when families come to it, come to us and come to you guys, like they can't not afford it, you know, because their yeah. child's like, you know, can't read and has had an IEP for seven years. Um, yeah. and that's a really like, you know, and that's just, you know, an intolerable and unacceptable, you know, circumstance to be in. Um, I would love to talk about if you all could kind of talk a little bit about how you measure progress in your institution, um, whether it be, you know, um, you know, on the, on the approved side through the IEP that you're following with the district and how you kind of, how you um, meet your mission, um, meet your goals and how you kind of, you know, I don't want to say tweak the IEP, but that's what I mean. And, um, and then, you know, how you, and, you know, obviously Christy on the, you know, on the transition side, how do you, how do you meet those goals, you know, through the, that are in the IEP. And then, you know, Jamie, I'd love if you would talk about that, like, cause all of you are measuring progress, whether it be, you know, through the, the state mandated form or not, you know, and for some of you, you're doing it in two different ways because some of your students are you know coming through a district placement and some of them are not. So um, I'd love to, to chat about that, Paul, if you wanna start the ball rolling. Yeah, and it's so hard for me sometimes to take off my public school hat because I just spent <laughs> so many years doing that. Um, but at American School for the Deaf, we have two programs um, that students can attend. We have our core program, which is a standard preschool through 12th grade for students who also happen to have, be deaf or hard of hearing. But then we also have our PACES program, which is a therapeutic program, um, which is one of only two in the country for deaf and hard of hearing students. Um, and it is 24 seven, 365, we never close. We've had students that live there even through the pandemic, through holidays. Um, so in either of those programs, because- And you also have, not to interrupt you, you also have yeah. the autism expansion program, which I love, yeah. which is a program yeah. for non-verbal um, hearing students with autism and, and to teach them sign language. And I think is like an incredible, incredible program. 
Yeah, thank you for bringing that for mentioning that. Yeah, this is our fourth year with that program. It started with high school older students who are hearing uh, nonverbal on the autism spectrum, and we're seeing some amazing success. Um, the students are all, um, all of them that are there happen to be residentially placed as well. Mm -hmm. Some five days, um, some are seven days. But um, providing them with this and, you know, ex either expressive or receptively utilizing a language. Um, and then that doesn't discount the use of, of uh, assistive devices as well, but those break or the batteries, you know, die. And so, but they always have their hands. So yeah. being able to give them some form of communication, we've seen a significant decrease in behavior. So yeah, that's a fairly new program uh, for a school that's been in existence for 205 years, but it's been really, really I just love it so much. Like, it's like yeah. one of my favorite things. It's so great. Yeah. It's fantastic. And we're very fortunate. The teacher is fabulous. She She's a great. Yeah. Teacher and yeah. was willing to learn sign language. And uh, so that's been really very successful. Um, but measuring progress again, whether it's, you know, on the public side or now uh, on this side, you know, we do certainly measure IEP progress, but that's not all of it. Right. So we were looking at, are they developing social emotionally? You know, are they, you know, what if it's behavioral, we, making sure that that data is going down? Are they successful in the community? If they're in the dorm, are they successful meeting those types of activities, whether it's doing your own laundry or, you know, cleaning your room, making your bed? I'm still working on that with my own children. But um, so those are, we, we try to take a broad look at measuring success. Um, certainly, we have to respond and, and answer to districts because all of our students uh, have some district involvement. Um, but we we like to look at a variety of things and, you know, standardized tests and things like that do not show the entire picture. So we try to find the right solution for each child to measure more than just what's on the IEP. We, we look at, at them as a whole child. Thank you. Um, Tammy, would you like to um, talk about Spire? I would, Christina. I just wanted to um, elaborate on what Paula was saying, which, there, you know, despite the fact that I had talked about some of the, the structure with the certifications for the teachers, there is a lot of flexibility and uniqueness that you can incorporate in your program that the districts come to rely on, actually, and, and mm -hmm. trust in terms of best fit for outplacements. Um, Spire, for example, has a really unique life coach model. And so that's a group of certified school counselors and school social workers who have very small caseloads, eight to 10 students. And they're working intensively with the students all day, every day in terms of dialectical behavioral therapy skills, cognitive behavioral therapy skills, executive function skills, self-advocacy, critical thinking, and really serving as a, the hub of communication, our community of allies, which is our faculty, our outside providers. Most of our students do have outpatient therapists and psychiatrists. Mm -hmm and also communication with you know, parents and districts. So I think it's important to, to think about the value, I think that the structure of the APSEP or approved private special, edu special education program model really does give a program in terms of having expectations in terms of following Connecticut Common Core and having the standardized testing, but also the flexibility to think about your unique metrics to be able to measure your particular student profile and their progress, whether that's the I, I, um, EP and progress indicators, or if that is thinking about, yes, their social emotional gains, their gains in confidence. I think the biggest um, hurdle for our students is just willing to be vulnerable, right? So coming in with, with a school avoidant population, just getting them in the door is a win. <laughs> Attendance yeah. is a major metric of yeah. success. Um, and then getting them to engage holistically in the classroom, to feel mm -hmm. like they're comfortable, to, to fear the vulnerability of, of saying, I don't know, and asking questions and judgment by peers, and to put themselves out there in the learning process to try things they've never done before. Um, a lot of our students really feel the perfectionism and the OCD yeah. of, if I can't do it perfectly, then why bother I at, do all? at all? Yeah, exactly. So giving them the freedom to fail, which is a natural part of the learning process and to make that feel safe and, and normal is, is huge. So yes, I think we really do get kind of the best of both worlds with the private independent day school flexibility and the electives and the approach that is uniquely combined with the structure that comes from the, the state approval. Wonderful. Christy, would you like to um, talk about this from the, the standpoint of, you know, your transition programs and also, you know, because you're largely a residential program, I'm interested to hear how those goals kind of like get drawn through the whole of the day, particularly as they relate to, you know, kind of social or, you know, or ADL goals, you know, as it were. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, if they're coming to us on, on an IEP, they definitely still have those transition goals and we are, you know, monitoring those and updating those. But at Chapel Haven, we actually begin assessing students as part of our admissions process. And then once they're admitted, we have a formal assessment at the 45 day mark. And then every six months we're meeting to track the progress formally. Um, so if there's IEP goals and objectives from um, a school district, that's part of it. But we actually do our own uh, goals and objectives as well, even if they don't come to us on an actual IEP. Mm -hmm. But we also have a really fantastic curriculum based assessment in both of our transition programs that is monitoring and assessing students across not just the classroom setting, but in the social setting, the community setting, the apartment right. setting. Right. vocational settings. Um, and we're able to use that data that we're gathering. I think there's like 200 and something different indicators because it's everything from life skills to the social communication skills to the, you know, vocational skills, following directions. And we use that throughout their time in the program to not only track their progress, but to also help us predict what level of supports they're likely to need as they are nearing the completion of the program. And so it gives us some indicators and recommendations about what would be appropriate support levels in our graduate community, as well as we can identify the areas where we know they're going to need that support, you know, from the get go. Um, so that's been really fantastic. And then I will just say on my end, one of the things I love about my job is hearing from the families after the students go home for their first break and spend some time around the family and it, parents' minds are just blown with the increase in the independence and the self-confidence and the initiation that they see. Um, so that's always a fantastic part as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Jamie, can you talk to us a little bit about how you measure progress at Windward? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, again, you know, I think the, one of the things that we, we do a lot of is think about sort of how we're kind of staging out and communicating progress to families. So from, a, from an academic standpoint, our language arts, for instance, we do um, our, our, uh, our PAF program, Printing Academic Failure, the reading program we use, has a lot of built-in assessments that we, so our kids are homogeneous by, by reading level, skill level. And so in our language arts class, we have a very sort of small targeted group on that. And then we do a lot of internal assessments that we do on a weekly kind of monthly basis for kids. So when we see a kid sort of moving a little faster than those in his group or a little bit slower than those in the group, we might, we might adjust the language arts group as we need to from that standpoint to kind of make sure we're able to kind of push a child in what I would almost consider that zone of proximal development and making sure that it's not too easy, not too hard, but that just, that just right space. Um, so we can kind of challenge them and move them along. Um, and then we have, we do some, uh, some additional assessments some formalized assessment along the way as well. But at the end of the year, we, we've actually started, we started this number of years ago, about 13, 14 years ago, where we do the, the, the Iowa's. And, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that, because uh, we, we just have a, a real belief that we want to kind of publish all of our data. So we actually mm -hmm. have been tracking this data for about 14, 15 years and looking at how from the intake to the uh, the last time they take this and where we move the means of those two groups. And so we, we look at this on a regular basis to help from a programmatic standpoint to say, you know, should we be teaching a little bit more of this here? Um, but from a language arts perspective, we wanna make sure we're measuring decoding through our windward coding test and, and vocabulary fluency, you know, comprehension development. And we, we check those things on a weekly basis. Um, the, um, the, uh, the progress report that we use is really skill focused. So, you know, so we don't, we probably look at our progress report out to parents a little bit differently. We have a pretty involved uh, report card and our, and our uh, one thing to love about our, our parent teacher conferences where we're communicating this a couple times a year to families is that, 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 that meeting tends to be, you know, not one where it's just, we're talking about, you know, yeah, you got to be in this or an A in this, but we're really kind of diving into the skills and where kids are and where their learnings are where their learning challenges are and what we're doing to kind of work through that. Mm -hmm. And you see parents in those moments who just start just overwhelmed with the emotion of, you know, not having had a conference where they've actually had a teacher sort of be able to speak in depth on their child mm -hmm. and what that means to them. And so it's, uh, I think our parents feel they're well taken care of in that regard. But, you know, as a psychologist, I think one of the things that I always try to do is how can we make, how we can make this better and how do we always kind of work together and think about what we can bring to the table to really show uh, proof, of, proof of progress along the way. Wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah. Bill, I am really interested to hear, you know, your perspective on this because I know that you came from a, um, a system that you basically created, you know, in managing, in, in, in um, 
you know, in, in, in looking at student progress, you know, it, the QSOL, you know, my, my favorite um, thing in the world and, you know, which is like, you know, kind of your baby as I, as I recall, uh, and to this sort of, you know, to that, you know, really flexible sort of um, student and teacher, you know, continuous feedback model to, you know, the, the new model, you know, that you're following, you know, for your, you know, for your district place students and for your students at large. So I'm really, really interested to hear, um, you know, how you found that and, you know, and what you're doing at Villa to, um, you know, to track the progress of your students over time. So it's, thank you. So it is going to sound a lot like what we just heard. So it, Going to my first year, I think that Villa Maria for a long time, because it was an APSEP, an approved school, it felt it needed to be driven by each individual IEP. And what I hoped to bring was to remind everybody that we're also an independent school. And my mantra has been, we are the accommodation, which means that just like Jamie said, we should be able to can, whether you're going to hear a familiar word from, from Winston, continually assess our kids, figure out what they need, and, and, and tweak our program, shift groups if we need to shift groups, mm -hmm. which you know an IEP doesn't necessarily allow you to do. Right. So the first thing we did was to come up with, with a battery um, that I hope to, again, gather. I, don't I, I only have one year of data. Hopefully, <laughs> we will have 15 years of data in 15 years. To, to see where our kids are on, on a fundamental list. And that it includes why it's subtested, it includes the PAF words, pieces of the, the PAF at the end of the year. The, um, it includes pieces of the self. Mm -hmm. um, that's at the end of the year assessment. Mm -hmm. But we've driven home this idea of, of formative assessments so that we can show up at an IEP meeting. And I want our teachers to know, how do you know what you know? And, and so we can continually uh, assess our kids um, and, and be able to give feedback to the districts so we can call. We just went through, I had 19 new students this year. Most of them have had 30 day reviews where um, we, again, the, our narrative reports, our fall report is, it's current acronym is our student learning support plan, which is our own IEP. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what any of the independent schools, we, our reports are much more comprehensive than an IEP. Sure, of course. Um, what my hope is that, each of the different school districts, and we're different, dealing with 24 different school districts in Connecticut uh, and New York, because I'm sure that most of us are. I want them to be able to look at our SLSP in the fall and say, oh my gosh, what a great picture of Christine this is. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to adopt some of that rather than the, the, the district saying, oh my gosh, this is exactly what Christine needs and this is what you need to be doing at your school. Mm -hmm. Because we're able to do so many different things that's why we're there, that the public schools cannot do. Right, right. Um, and that's the whole point, you know, Absolutely. that's the whole point, yeah. And, and going back to the sticker shock, that's part yeah. of what we're able to do. Yeah. And, but I, what we need to, your, your question's a great one because we need to hold ourselves accountable. You know, what are we doing? We need to be able to talk to and, and show our parents our progress. Mm -hmm. And some of it's not as clear. It's, it's easy to show comprehension or decoding progress, but all of these life skill, that, yeah. that we talked about, it's really hard and that's more nebulous. Yeah. We did, I, um, the measure that we designed at, at Winston was, was to, to kind of encapsulate some of this learning how to learn, self-advocacy, yeah. self-reliance, all of yeah. those, which, you know, it's, it's, it's subjective. Right. Um, and how do you standardize that? You know, and it's, um, again, that, that still will continue to be our challenge. I mean, I love, I love the QSOL. Um, I love that, you know, the, the different perspectives, you know, cause if you think about like any like psychological testing that anyone does on anyone, it's like, you're doing parent questionnaires, there's teacher questionnaires, there's a student questionnaire if they're old enough. And it's like, you're encompassing all of these different, you know, these different perspectives into like, you know, into the picture of the child. Um, so it's really, you know, it's really interesting to be able to, um, I think for you guys, you know, be able to operate in a model that um, is, you know, like, you know, has a prescribed model, you know, in terms of what you're doing for the, you know, for the state. I mean, obviously, you know, even if you're not an approved school, you still have, you know, you're still seeing IEPs, you're still going to CSE meetings, you're still participating in that PPT process, you know, so you're still like, you know, um, you know, helping families, you know, you know, with that process. 
Um, I think for, I mean, for the, my last question of the evening is, you know, sort of how do you help families navigate that process? Like, how do you partner with families? And cause it's really like, you know, there's three of you, right? There's like, there's the family, there's the school and there's the district, you know? So, and most of us, you know, don't have the, um, you know, the ability to completely divorce the district, you know, for the whole of the child's educational career. They're a partner. They're there. They're going to be there, you know, until the child is 18 or 22 or whatever it is. So, I mean, I'd love to hear um, your perspectives on how you partner with, um, you know, those three, how, how the three of you partner together to um, achieve the best um, outcome for, for your kids. Um, I'm going to mix this one up. Um, Tammy, do you want to go um, go first? Certainly. Thank you. Yeah. So it depends if we have um, a public school outplaced student versus a privately placed student. If it is a public school outplaced student, which is about 80 to 85 percent of our current student body, then generally it's the district making a referral. So they're sending us the initial application packet, which has information about the student's transcript and neuropsych testing, cognitive assessments. Um, academic assessments, et cetera. We're reviewing that with our team. Um, we're having communication with the family right from the get-go. I think the most important thing is to just be transparent in terms of what we can offer, what profile we best serve, what are our services, and, and is that compatible with what the family is ultimately looking for? Um, and then having the communication all along about what this needs to look like, because some folks have been through four schools in the last five years and they want a home and other students come in and they just want to spend maybe ninth and 10th grade here and then they're thinking about transition back into the public school right, right. and so i think it's important that we understand and, and of course the trajectory can change and that's fine that's the point of the open communication throughout the process right. so once we're getting to know the family and their needs you know students are coming to to shadow they're getting tours they're getting a, a whole sense of what's happening in the classroom and in the social milieu um, we have a admissions committee meeting where we're doing release information phone calls and really kind of rounding out a very holistic picture of the student, mm -hmm. what their needs are and are they compatible with the resources that we can offer. Um, if we decide to move forward with the student and the district is involved, then we're letting the district know this is a good fit. We're having a placement PPT that the family, the district and our team are involved in so that can, we can really talk about the IEP that we will now be following with integrity. Is it a perfect match to the services we offer for that student, or are we going to have communication in the next 30 days, which is more likely, about how we're going to tweak that IEP to best suit the student's needs in this new environment? And I think the biggest thing going forward is transparency in that communication about that student's growth and the needs, which are evolving. It's, it's not a nice linear trajectory. You don't necessarily just make progress. There's stagnation. Yep. There's regress. Yep. Um, so there has to be opportunities to have a dynamic discussion about the student's goals and their progress towards the goals and new goals that will evolve, certainly. Yeah. Um, I think what's really important, again, is to think about oftentimes we're preparing our students to return to district. Um, if we have an 11th or 12th grader coming in, oftentimes they're graduating from us and, and moving on to college. But in middle school and early high school, we want to figure out, do you, do you want to stay here? Do you think you want to be transferring to a different independent private school? Are we thinking boarding school or do you want to turn to the public school? And I think the biggest thing is that, again, we're talking the whole time with the district and the parents and the students to manage expectations about what are the goals that you need to be successful in the public school, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, again, talking all along the way about progress towards those goals. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, Christy, can you talk about the, um, the, uh, the partnership process and particularly as it relates to, you know, the ASAT program, because that's a, you know, I mean, that's a program, you know, with a, you know, with the definitive end. I mean, obviously, ever all the programs have a definitive end, but, you know, you're really moving those students, not um, only, to, I mean, you're moving them towards an independent life. And how mm -hmm. do you partner with the district to, you know, to do that, to move towards that goal? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, what Tammy said about that whole referral process and the replacement PPT, I mean, nailed it. Like, I just want to say ditto to all of that. <laughs> but then, yeah, so for us, you know, part of the important partnership is helping prepare the family and the student for the world of adult services, because usually when they're with us, they're coming to the end of their time with the school district. Yeah. They're not going to be returning there. And so we've got to work really hard with the time that we have so that we can equip them as best as possible to be as independent as possible and to know how to access 
those adult service resources um, that come next. And so, um, you know, we work with the districts to accomplish that and then also, you know, use some of our own resources as well, whether we're making referrals or we don't make the referrals, but we're the help the families start navigating maybe the DDS process or the DSS process, you know, and the autism waiver side of things. Um, so I think that, you know, the districts have been really great in recognizing that, you know, we really excel in our transition programming. I mean, that's why they sent the student to us in the first place um, and really trusting us with how we're uh, tracking their progress and reporting it, you know, and sharing it with all of the important stakeholders. Um, but they've also been really great too in coming to the table and helping us to address the challenges. So like Tammy was saying, whenever we're hitting a little bit of a hurdle or a roadblock and you know we need to come together and think outside the box together for some strategies and some uh, solutions, we've had really great success with that too. Wonderful. Paula? So uh, ours is a little bit more unique because we, we have the added yes. um, you know, part of, of our program and that's language access, right? Yeah. And so 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents. So part of our picture is uh, sign language classes for families. And uh, so we do offer free family sign language classes. Right now they are over in, they are in Zoom, um, but typically they are in person, but we're actually finding that it's a little bit easier for families, especially in the evenings to do it on Zoom. We're getting a huge amount of participation now because mm -hmm. they don't have to leave home or find babysitters, yeah. et cetera. Um, so that's also part of our equation. And as Tammy and Christy both mentioned, getting the student involved in this conversation as well. So where do you wanna go next? What is the mode of communication for us that you wanna use? Do you want your cochlear implant or do you wanna be fully immersed in the deaf community and culture? So um, I guess it's just you know, making sure that everybody is at the table, including the district and the family and the students um, mm -hmm to make sure that, and as Tammy said, to be transparent about what, what is the expectation? What, what are we looking at five years down the road, 10 years down the road? Wonderful. Jamie, one of my favorite things about um, WinWord, besides the, the teacher training program and the Institute is, um, you know, is your CSE reps that partner with the families, you know, and full disclosure, um, Lara Damashek, who is one of our board members is a um, CSC rep for Winward and she's amazing. Um, and I, you know, from a, from a parent's perspective, having been in that position um, where you're kind of, um, you know, your child is outplaced at, you know, a school and you still have to have these meetings, but what do you do and what do you say? And, you know, my child's doing, doing great, but not too good, you know, like, cause they, cause I don't want them to leave. So I think that the CSC reps that you have at Winward, I don't know if that's the exact name, but, um, but you know what yeah. I mean, are, um, you know, are, are really a tremendous resource for families, you know, throughout the, even if they're not, um, you know, I mean, a lot of your, I mean, all your students, you know, generally go back to, um, you know, a district school um, after their time with you, correct? Or some, you know, some combination of, of, of yeah, that. So I think it's, a, you know, that it's a, it's a great resource for families. Yeah. So, you know, I think that the way we kind of partner is really kind of threefold on the admission side of this. Our admissions team is folks coming into us. We'll get teacher recommendation. We'll work with families to make sure we've got a good neuropsych. We've got a, we've got a really great lighthouse team. Uh, I would offer of an admissions team who really helps get all those things kind of in place to make sure we're understanding the overall profiles of kids coming into us. And then I think you're right. Lara is is phenomenal. She she's a CRC liaison who works and partners with districts to make sure we keep and maintain active IEPs for kids. So that way, mm -hmm. when they go back and transition back out, they don't lose those services. And I think she and, and Peter uh, do a phenomenal job with the team uh, and our teachers to make that happen. Um, and you know, and in, inside of you know our community, we we believe our parents are going to be some of the best advocates that that we can create help create for our for their kids. So we also have a series of parent educational sort of workshops where parents get to take learn more about the language based learning disabilities, the executive function, the IEP process, and so we provide some ongoing support from that. And occasionally, like in New York City, where we have a lot more. Um, you know, hearings where parents are sort of pressing the public, the DOE down there for reimbursement for tuition. So we also provide some layers of support around that, helping families get organized for that. Yeah. Um, it's a typically an independently operated uh, sort of process. We just provide some 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 uh, present levels and support for our families. And Lara does a great job helping 
you know, provide some testimony for, for the, those kinds of things. Um, on the outplacement side, we actually have uh, an outplacement director in Westchester and one in the city mm -hmm. for our, our schools. And our kids go to a variety. They, they come from public, parochial, and, pro and independent schools, and they go back to to public, parochial, and independent And just to clarify, when you mean a, outplacement, you mean like the transition out of a From, from leaving to, Windward, yeah, yeah. Leaving Windward. Yeah. Yeah, so we're sometimes what jokingly call the wild, right? So our kids are going back out into a space that yeah. hopefully is going to be hospitable to them, and we've provided the right right tools to make sure we do that. Um, but we do a lot of support and placement in the in that next in that next school. Mm -hmm. So our out, outplacement directors will work with the receiving schools because some of our kids, you know, we have families who will leave public education, come to us, and have been a public school family for their entire you know existence. And when they leave us, they decide maybe that's the that's the best route, and some decide maybe that's not the best route because we have some kids who will still hold on to well, Mrs. Smith and the fourth grade said this to me, and I can't ever walk back in that building. And, We've got to help families work through that, and occasionally, you know, we'll we'll you know we'll find some ways to repair some of those things and be that bridge from a, a parent to a school district and then going into a new building. But we we have some really active conversations with families about you know making sure that it's really an aligned fit because um, we want our kids when they leave us to kind of maintain that sense of success and that that sense of uh, forward momentum. So we really help in that process to make sure we're helping families think through like this, here's what the needs are. Because our kids, you know, while we do a great job of remediating some of uh, the learning uh, issues pretty pretty well, your kids are still going to need some support and services as they grow and, and continue in their high school uh, journey. And so we want to make sure we set up to help set up those plans. And occasionally once kids, you know, transition, we'll get a phone call to say, hey, sophomore year, this is not going as well as I would like. Can you, can you help us? And again, our outplacement team, I think, does a great job. And occasionally our CSD folks will get involved in those conversations as well. Wonderful. Bill, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, at Villa, you're supporting families, you know, um, and districts and, and, and all just kind of working together, you know, as a team. Um, I, you know, myself having, you know, kind of been through this, you know, in the Winston model, um, did not think that I was ever going to trust a school administrator again until I got to Winston. So, um, you know, I, you know, I, I know that, you know, families come at this, pro you know, at this process and it's very fraught, you know, when they've, you know, they've, they've brought their child to you, they're trusting you, you know, to, you know, you know, maybe in some cases repair some damage that's been done in previous institutions. Tammy, I know you deal with that all the time. Um, how do you do that? How do you bring them, bring everyone back together? So there's uh, two two ways that um, one is very much is similar to what Wimmer does. Joanne Sabato is our uh, our liaison between our families and our districts. You know, again, like everyone here has said, from the moment uh, during admissions, we're already thinking about what that ex missions outplacement looks like. You know, our goal is ultimately for all of us is independence. You know, what can we do to help our kids become independent when they leave us? Mm -hmm. um, so we're always thinking about that. Joanne is the one who is, um, you know, we, we've, as we've shuffled what leadership looks like at, at Villa, um, her primary job is that liaison, but part of acting as liaison is, is holding families' hands with the CSE or PPT, but also developing those relationships with those districts so that they better understand our program and, and feel better about placing kids at our school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're right now, we're at close to 30% district placed kids and almost everyone else um, is a settlement. And I, I hope to increase the number of district place kids as we establish better relationships with the districts. Um, going so far as I would love to, and I'll say this now publicly, and I've said it to uh, Wayne Holland, who's the director of special education in Stanford, I would love a hybrid model. I would love to think about what this would look like uh, to have a villa middle school or villa high school um, you know, we talked earlier before we went on air, uh, you know, a school for our, our high school students with Asperger's. Um, uh, what would that look like? And, and could we do something that was a collaboration so they would get the remediation that they would need from Villa Maria? Yeah, but and, also and the, the social, you know. The social, yeah. the extracurricular activities, yeah. you know, from, from the- You and I have school. talked about this, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, that, that's, my, that's, my, that's my hope um, that we're able to do. It. And, and that, again, in this- idea that we're an APSEP and an independent school, mm -hmm. you know, puts us in a unique position to kind of hopefully navigate and establish those kinds of partnerships. Because, um, you know, right now for our families, 
this, the CSC or PPT process, it's an a la carte process. Our kids come to us with a myriad of services. That's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a lot of pull out. And there's yeah. no, there's nothing is integrated about that program. Um, so I would love to be able to kind of influence what public schools are doing as well. Wonderful. Well, thank, this has been amazing. Um, I hope that it was for you too. Um, I feel like um, I'm walking away with um, just so much more knowledge than I had starting, um, you know, like an hour ago. And I um, want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank Paula, Tammy, Christy, Jamie, and Bill for participating in this, um, you know, in this, in this forum and, you know, in discussing, you know, like what you guys do, what you do best and, you know, what your hopes and dreams are for your students. So thank you again so much for joining us and um, look forward to our next webinar on January 12th with our panel of special education advocates. So thank you so much. Have a great evening. Christine, thank you very much. Thanks, Christine. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye.